Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being with me today. This is a remarkably exciting day for us. I'm going to start by telling you that we did a protracted investigation over the last two years. It ended up with the oral intercept or a wiretap, as we know. It's important to understand that when you do a wiretap investigation, that immediately that investigation is going to leave your jurisdiction. It always does. Because we're dealing with an international smuggling ring that operated out of Winter Haven, Florida. There was a lot of predicate cases that was put together before the wiretap was ever requested. And it, take, it takes an entire team of people across the United States. So first I want to introduce to you those that are standing up with me, and then we'll talk about the other agencies that were involved, and you can get a flavor for the complexity of the coordination of this investigation. First and foremost, none of this can happen without our State Attorney Brian Haas, who's with us today. Mr. Haas and his wonderful prosecutors, Nicole Orr and Jennifer Ordonez, are in charge of this investigation. They have worked hand in glove with us for over two years. Our state attorney is the real deal in Polk County vernacular. He puts bad guys in jail. He prosecutes people. He does what's right. And we're proud to have him prosecuting for us in the 10th Judicial Circuit. Osceola Sheriff Marcos Lopez, a good friend of mine and my colleague, we helped us immensely during this investigation, and he's standing up with us today. FDLE Special Agent in Charge Mark Brutnell from our Tampa office is here with us today. All of them will speak, as well as our police chief from Winter Haven, who worked closely with us because this organization was focused on and operated out of Winter Haven, David Brannan. But without Homeland Security Investigations, we have Group Supervisor Darcy Corton and U.S. Border Patrol Agent in Charge Matthew Heckmanzik. We could not have been successful. We had to have contacts and we had to have work to, that occurred from the importation of methamphetamine by the pound, by the multiple pound from Mexico into Los Angeles and Fresno. And from LAX to Fresno, all of this drug flowed through some through Memphis and some directly to us through the Orlando airport. So we also had the U.S. Postal Inspection Service, the Orlando Police Department, the Tampa International Airport Police Department, the St. Lucie County Sheriff's Office, the Fresno Police Department, and the Shelby County Sheriff's Office in Tennessee assist us. Now, all of these predicates in front of a press conference, usually people go, eh. But I want you to understand, without them, this couldn't have come together. It was that massive an operation. So we began in September of 2020. We received information that the Jefferson family from Winter Haven was smuggling large amounts of drugs into Florida, from Mexico through California and then to the streets of Central Florida. In February of 22, we ultimately initiated the wiretap. And why did we do this? We bought and made predicate cases for the wiretap throughout the two ensuing years, but we couldn't get to the top and link the organization together. This was a very different kind of operation. If you look at our org chart there, you notice that there's kind of three distinct groups of people. They were all interacting, but they had heads of each organization, and we'll go over and introduce you to some of them in a few minutes, but it wasn't the traditional organization. It was multifaceted. So we started the investigation, and here's what we determined. We determined that this large amount of drugs, by and large, was being smuggled to us from LAX 
in domestic flights, and I want to focus on domestic fight, flights for just a few minutes. As a result of this investigation, we arrested 85 suspects. We added 355 new felony charges, 93 new misdemeanor charges to them. But listen, folks, I am sick and tired of this national media and these national groups telling us that drugs are low level and nonviolent. I think we'll demonstrate to you in just a few minutes that it's anything other than low level and nonviolent. That's right. The overwhelming majority of these people, not everyone, but the overwhelming majority of them had a previous 690 felony charges that had been filed against them as well as 194 previous convictions and 712 misdemeanors. So we're not dealing with people that are low-level, nonviolent people. Where did all of that silliness come from? And it's important to understand, and I want the people of this country to understand, they get to watch this on social media from my lips to their ears that anybody that's trying to advance an agenda that drugs aren't dangerous, that drugs aren't deadly, they are lying to you. They are not telling you the truth. In this particular operation, we seized 268 pounds of methamphetamine, 6.8 ounces of fentanyl. Now that doesn't sound like a lot, just 6.8 ounces. But according to our DEA partners, two milligrams of fentanyl can be a deadly overdose. Okay, Grady, so what does all that mean? It means that 6.8 ounces of fentanyl could have killed up to 96,000 people. And we know in this investigation, and I'll repeat it again, that one of the Jefferson family, prior to the startup of this investigation, died from a drug overdose but still their family poured this poison into our community even though one of their loved ones died from some of the same drugs they were importing and selling on the streets. We seized a total of 49 firearms, all kinds of other assorted drugs and pills worth $12.8 million and we seized $235,000 in cash. We know firsthand there were at least two drug overdose during this investigation. And one of the drug overdoses, as I said, was one of the Kingpin's brothers that occurred just before we kicked the entire investigation off. It's important to understand why we were up on the wiretap that we heard chatter within minutes, within minutes of an unsolved homicide that's still being worked diligently by the Winter Haven Police Department at this time. So when you know that you have at least two overdose deaths, when you know that there is chatter on your wiretap as to a murder that just occurred in the city of Winter Haven, you're dealing with violent, dangerous people. So I want to point out when we talk about low-level nonviolent crimes, this is what people were, were having pointed in their face. I'm going to introduce you to a guy who was kicking the door in and doing home invasion robberies and telling people he was the police. But look at the high-powered firearms that we seized. Now you see this firearm and you go, yeah, that's a pretty ominous looking firearm. Well, our folks, our detectives from the various agencies who are simply the very best in these long-term investigations had to face these guns, had to risk their life to get this gun away from hardened criminals and put them in jail. So at the end of the day, it's important to understand that people risk their lives in law enforcement in order for an investigation of this to come to a successful conclusion. 
But I want to highlight one event before I get to our folks. Listen to me, folks. There's nothing more than important to us than the screening that occurs on our aircraft. When I hear people grumble and complain about having to go through scanners and, and TSA checking and their bags checked, and I hear that grumbling, I think, are you all out of your minds? They're keeping you safe. They're protecting your life. And I'm excited and thankful when I go through a TSA screening that those folks are there doing that for me. But here's what we know. Over and over and over on these domestic airlines from LAX, through suitcases, drugs were smuggled here. That's right, look at this. On one occasion, on one airline, six suitcases with this drug was smuggled into Orlando. They didn't so much as throw a pair of underwear in the suitcase to act like they were hiding the drugs. You think LAX has got a drug smuggling problem at the airport? I believe that they do, and they need to address it ASAP. There were six of these suitcases on one flight. Think about that. Let me show you what this group looked like. All of this came in on one flight. One flight. So what happened at the other end of the line? There needs to be a deep dive into the baggage handlers and to see where the hookup was to allow suitcase after suitcase after suitcase to get through the scanning with no clothes inside, no evidence of clothes inside, just drugs. You think we've got a big operation going on here? I think we've uncovered a problem for LAX. Ninety-four pounds of meth and 48 pounds of cannabis came in that day on that one aircraft. And here are the masterminds. Here are the ringleaders from left to right. Abdash McKenzie, Demarcus Jefferson, Dwayne Stackhouse Sr., Leonard Henderson, Javaris Samuel, and DeMarte Munson. You'll hear more about them in a few minutes. But I want you to see the men who masterminded, who were the ringleaders, who put together this very complicated invest in, in this very complicated criminal enterprise ring that we investigated, and see how dangerous these men are. And Demarcus Jefferson lost his brother to the same drugs, the same poison he was peddling in our community. So let's look at some of the individual players. Here's Abdash McKenzie. We'll go over real quick. He was selling fentanyl pills. He would tell us that in the undercover operations, I operate in mysterious ways so the cops can't catch me. Newsflash. It wasn't so mysterious. He got his first job in nine years recently at KFC, Kentucky Fried Chicken. Do you know why? He was proud of that $200 he made that week. Now he's a major drug smuggler. Why did he do that? Well, he was jammed up in a custody dispute, and he had to show the judge that he had a legitimate job. Otherwise, where did the money come from? But... He is a businessman because then he would pay his co-workers with dope to prep his workstation at work. But he's an ethical KFC guy because my guys ask him, can we have the recipe for the Kentucky Fried Chicken? He wouldn't give it up. 
if he had it. But this guy was scamming the system the whole way. Then there's De Demarcus Jefferson. He's another local kingpin of the operation. His brother is the one at only 25 years of di age died of a drug overdose. Ladies and gentlemen, let me underscore once again. I can't understand how in the world DeMarcus could peddle poison to people when his family suffered such a loss as their 25-year-old kid brother. But there are people dying every day across this country because of drug overdoses and drug abuse. And yet we continue to try to downplay it as nonviolent, low-level drugs. You'll hear me say that a lot. The next person that tells you that, ask them if they're out of their mind or if they're on drugs because it's dangerous. Now, along the way, just before the investigation, here's Demarcus Jefferson's vehicle as he was intoxicated and drove through the front of a store. Some of the local news stations covered this. But what did he have with him when he drove into the front of this school store while impaired? He had drugs because he made phone calls and we have videos from the store of people running up with mask on, going into the trunk and taking items out of the trunk before law enforcement arrive. DeMarcus is also involved in violent crashes. Then there's Antonio Jefferson, another one of the family members. In April 2021, we and the Florida Department of Law Enforcement charged him with armed trafficking and methamphetamine. While, let me say this clearly, I don't want you to miss it. While out on bond, he was trafficking more methamphetamine. Did you hear what I told you? Let me say that again so you want to hear it clearly. I don't want to stutter. In April, we arrested him with FDLE on armed trafficking of meth. He bonded out and was trafficking in meth. And then we heard him on the intercept saying, my attorney wants me to help. He wants me to cooperate. He wants me to give substantial assistance. He bragged, how can I do that? I'm the head of my organization. How can I help? Well, we're going to help Antonio Jefferson. We're going to help him to the state prison for a very long time. I hope his attorney got paid in advance. Then there's Nathaniel Carr. He was federally indicted for robbery from home invasion robberies where he portrayed himself as a law enforcement officer where he was kicking in doors throughout Central Florida. He's in custody. But we also have him for conspiracy to traffic in methamphetamine that occurred before he was arrested for his robbery arrest. He resided in Lakeland. He currently resides in federal lockup. Then there's Vicente Basanta. He's here from Venezuela with political asylum. Did you hear that? He is here with political asylum. Apparently his ex-wife, who's not with him anymore and is not here, was a news reporter for the opposing party in Venezuela. So when the new party came in, she was scared, and guess what? He fled to the United States. Does he appreciate the United States? Oh, no, he doesn't appreciate the United States. He comes here to traffic in drugs. And what you have here is a Bible case, you see? People recognize these as Bible cases. But what did Vicente 
do? He carried his drugs in these Bible cases. Now, how much more low down can you get? So we give political asylum to a guy from Venezuela to come to this country to traffic in drugs and hide it in Bible cases. What the heck? I'm certain there must be some other words for him beside what I've said, but they probably wouldn't be appropriate. Oh, he was trafficking in cocaine. <coughs> He's still here legally on asylum. I say we send him back. This is Clay Bryan. Now this is interesting. To tell you how this international operation goes, Clay pulls up at the racetrack gas station in Eagle Lake. And he leaves the car running. Did you hear what I said? He left the car running while he ran into the store. Was he only going to be gone a short time? Voila. Three juveniles from the area steal his car. And all of a sudden, they're wrapped up in an international drug smuggling operation when, they're, when they steal the guard of the stash house's vehicle, which had a pound of meth in it. But being the enterprising young men that they were, not knowing they were in with some really bad dudes, they found the meth. But did they decide, let's abandon our stolen car and our meth? No. Then they talked about, hey, I'm going to sell this meth and make some real money. That's right. So these little dudes not only ripped off a major international drug smuggling operation, then they were going to sell the dope to make a profit. Well, they all got arrested. But it's funny how there's twists and turns because they did us a favor by stealing that car that day. All of that led us back to Clay Bryan, and we seized an additional 24 pounds of meth. And it all started because they stole the car that Clay was operating. Thank you, you little criminals. Rasperts. Then there's Dormonte Munson. He's known as D-Money. He's a local rapper. He was a mastermind. He was one that really put together the trips from the LAX to Florida. But here's the neat thing about Dormonte. He would go through the community. He would provide fireworks on the holidays. He would have Christmas gift giveaways. He would provide Easter egg hunts. You see, he was the good guy in the community, made the money, shared it with the kids. You know, he was grooming himself as a community charitable contributor for the underprivileged the whole time he's doing it with smuggled and trafficked drug money. He had an associate. Samuel Javaris. Samuel Javaris got a legitimate Georgia driver's license with a false name on it, and he booked the flights. He utilized the false names. It worked. He had a robbery warrant and a VOP for battery on a law enforcement that was 10 years old. We couldn't find him. He had taken on a new identity successfully. And he had a friend with him, Aldrea McPherson. You see, he's big time. He had a home in Fresno and a home in Davenport, and he moved the drugs. And when we went to stop them so that we could serve the search warrant, Andrea, or Aldrea, called children who she had access to and told them, hide the dope. Little kids, hide the dope. Are you kidding me? 
So what did they do with their money? They bought gold, lots of gold. This won't even fit over my head like the last one, so I'll just hold it up. $36,000 worth of gold. So they're providing things for kids in the neighborhood. They're buying gold. They're telling their family and friends about how successful they are. And the whole time they're peddling poison to your kids. I'm, I, I want to turn the, the podium over to Brian Haas, our state attorney, who is simply, as I've said before, the very best. There's not enough positive words to say because our state attorney's office is game on about how do we protect the people in the community? How do we keep people safe? And when we suggest these long, very difficult, very difficult, complicated cases that some prosecutors across the state and nation want to run from because of their complexity, our state attorney and his team run to those cases in order to protect the community. Mr. Haas. Thank you, Sheriff. I'm very thankful to have been able to be a part of this investigation from the very beginning and understand all the complexities and all the work that went into this. I think that this case, these cases show how our communities are all tied, not just here within our county, but across our state and across our nation and across our world, which is why it's important that we all do our jobs to make sure that the criminals are being dealt with appropriately. Being easy on the criminals, wanting to be their friends, that's not the answer uh, when you're dealing with folks like this. You've got to be aggressive and you've got to take control of the situation, which this is a, a step in that direction. I think one of the things that really left an impact on me was the amount of work that went into this case. And I know some of the folks that were involved are here today, uh, prosecutors from my office, uh, but across agencies, uh, detectives, and, and folks that spent hours and hours and hours uh, putting the time in, probably missing uh, events with their family and things like that, making those sacrifices to put this case together. And I think that um, a lot of that goes uh, a little bit unthanked for all the work that they did, but uh, we certainly appreciate it, all the work that you've done. Um, the case, is it's an important day here today, um, but there's a lot of work still to do a lot of prosecutions you see this board that's that's a lot of cases we we have a lot of cases and we just got some more uh, but we're up for the task and we're committed to making sure that we see this through all the way to the end it will take a long time the last thing i'll say is is a, is a word of thanks to sheriff judd if you look at all of the people up here today and all the folks that were assembled to make this happen um, it's not just local folks it's st other state agencies federal agencies um, it's because of Sheriff Grady Judd and his leadership that this happened. Um, it all starts at the top, and we are so fortunate to have our sheriff as the leader of uh, making sure that this all happened. So uh, thank you, Sheriff, for all your work. Thank you, Mr. Haas. Uh, the Osceola Sheriff, Sheriff uh, Marcos Lopez, is a dear friend of mine. And our counties not only abut up to each other, but we have a major metropolitan center where the county line runs kind of through the middle of town. So we have part of the town, and, and Sheriff Lopez has the majority of the town, but we work closely every day on all kinds of investigations. And Sheriff Lopez is the epitome of professionalism and cooperation. Uh, Sheriff, thank you for the opportunity to work with you. You have some comments? I just want to thank uh, everyone for having us here, Sheriff. You know, all the people that work together to uh, take care and, and make sure that we good, could put good cases together for prosecution with a state attorney is really important because uh, this poison is really killing people. And, um, you know, criminals don't know borders or boundaries. And like the Sheriff says, they go back and forth from Osceola to Polk. And, um, you know, we really got to maintain a firm hand and make sure that our state prosecutors are putting them in prison for a long time. You know, they don't care. Don't wait till 
some of this stuff hits your neighborhood and one of your kids die, you know, you guys got to be supportive and make sure when you go to those polls and elect those elected officials that are going to be tough on the crime, um, be very selective and do your research because believe it or not, it affects you. Your property values will drop and you'll start getting this type of trash in your area and you're going to regret it. Um, but I thank uh, Sheriff for this opportunity and thank everyone for being here, all the men and women that do this every day and risk their lives to uh, expose themselves to these dangers. Uh, there's, you know, there's a lot of work to be done. Like they said, this case will still go on for a little bit, but all these people, hopefully, will stay in jail for a long time. Thank you all. Thank you, Sheriff. And, and we have Mark Brutnell, who is the special agent in charge out of Tampa with us from FDLA. March teams and our team work together every day in short term and, and protracted investigations and this is only one more example. But FDLE is always there and, and we, lo we love their, their energy and their enthusiasm and we really love that statewide jurisdiction. Come on up. Thank you, Sheriff. Good morning, everybody. I first and foremost like to thank the investigative team and the prosecution team that are here. You guys did amazing work. Without that hard work, we would not be here today to make us all look good. You guys are the true champions behind the scenes. Clearly, this drug trafficking organization does not know jurisdictional boundaries. And the amount of poison they've peddled and the firearms and the violent crimes that come with it is very, very scary. But it's a daunting task that obviously we're all up to, to handle. Again, they don't know jurisdictional boundaries, but I got good news for the public. Either do we. As you see here, federal, state, local, all working hand in hand with big results. Again, I want to thank the men and women that put this case together. It was an excellent job. Job well done. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. And we have Police Chief David Brennan, who's going to make some comments. Chief Brennan and his team and my team work together every day, everything from minor disturbances to the most major international smuggling rings. And I can always, always depend on the Winter Haven Police Department and Sheriff Brandon, I mean, Sheriff Brandon, maybe, maybe, I hope you don't run against me next time. <laughs> Chief, Chief Brandon, I worked for a Sheriff Brandon one time. Chief David Brandon is there with every operation we do. Everyone. All the time. And he is very special to us. Chief, come on up. First, I'll thank you for the promotion today. So, <laughs> um, we, as always, as he said, we're always working with the sheriff's office. We're also working with other agencies because we can't do this job, like they said, to drug dealers. They don't know where it stops and where it stops. And as you can see, they're going all over the country and international. Um, it's very important, one, to work with each other so we're successful for our community because it's not just Winter Haven, it's Polk County. Also, uh, even just for the safety of our own detectives and making sure that we're working together and not stepping on each other's toes. As I look at this board today, there's several names that I see and recognize uh, more than I would care to admit over the years, whether it's them or their family members that I dealt with back when I was a patrol officer or a narcotics sergeant, uh, worked cases with the sheriff's office on them, doing different buys. Um, and just to go back to what they're talking about in fentanyl and how dangerous that is these days, it's not just the people that are taking narcotics that they know may have fentanyl in it because that's what they want. It's also the people now that are probably buying marijuana, not wanting fentanyl, and don't know it's there. That's what we're dealing with. The overdoses are going up and up, um, and we're having to deal with that. And not just that, just the safety of our officers not knowing every time they open up a package of drugs, what are they going to be dealing with. So I do appreciate the sheriff having us here today and, and the assistance we were able to give on this case. Thank you, Chief. And our... Federal partners have chosen not to speak publicly, but don't let their lack of public comments overshadow the fact that they were game on and totally engaged every step of the way. And had it not been for them, there's a lot of things that we could not have accomplished in this. So you guys are simply, simply awesome, and we appreciate it very much. Okay, does the media have any questions of any of the team up here? Years has this operation been in operation? Yes, ma'am. We've known about some of these players, and, and as you can tell by the previous felony arrest, they've been arrested periodically. But the information came to us that the Jefferson family was heavily involved in major league methamphetamine smuggling, and we've been working this investigation about two years, a little more than two years. We're right at it. But information 
is, and we've known that they have been involved in smugglings and robberies and, and drug dealing for a number of years, but we didn't know of this operation until we collected our intelligence and worked with the other officers and involved. But you, you must understand that my organized crime team, my detectives at work and special investigations and our supervisors, ladies and gentlemen, they're simply the very best in this business. And they're game on all the time and they work with their colleagues across the state and nation. And that's why these cases come together. We still have three people out of state that are still at large and are on the lam that we're working with our colleagues. But when we can pick up the phone and the Fresno police are game on to help us, that's important. The Orlando police officers and the police department's game on. But, but I can't overemphasize, these folks have been in trouble before. You know, these folks didn't roll out of Sunday school and decide they would create a little mischief this week. These are hardcore people for the most part. I'm a little hung up on the drugs in the suitcase thing. Um, were these drugs that were in checked bags, and are, is there evidence that TSA agents just were in on it? Well, this, this drug was in checked bags. And sometimes they would have what they call ghost tickets. They would get a ticket to travel, check their bag, and never get on the airplane. And the suitcase would fly by itself. Other times, in this particular case where we took the six suitcases off, there were people on the planes with the drugs, six of them. But they're very talented and they're very experienced. So this is not the first time these drugs have leaked through, which causes you to be suspicious of when they schedule the flights and who was on duty down checking the baggage in because they would come off of the planes, through the security, down the elevators, and spread out. We watched a very, very, very impressive effort to, for them to uh, be able to pick their drugs up and avoid detection. We did surveillance, and people would come from Orlando and they would go to Lakeland and then down to Bartow and then back to Winter Haven before they'd end up back in Davenport. They would make a round robin trip. So they were very calculated, but look, they weren't hiding this among clothes. They were sending it in this form. So at the end of the day, there was a hook someplace. There had to be. LAX needs to get on this. What's amazing to me is that you're sending your kid back to college or you know, your cousin's coming from New York or whatever, and they're on the same plane as this. Thousands upon thousands of people have flown domestically <laughs> with drugs in the cargo hole underneath of them. Is there an indication that there's a distribution network going on in other cities just like this, considering that it was as complex as having air, airline flights and other things? This particular operation was here, but we would have to be naive not to think that there's other major smuggling operations going on just like this across the country. This is just, this is kind of three smuggling operations all working together. Like I said, there wasn't just one boss of this. There were kind of like collateral duties across the different operations. But of course there is. Can you tell us how many people were wiretapped and how that played into all this? I can tell you, was it nine, nine telephones we listened to? Eleven. Eleven telephones we listened to over this operation. And understand, when, when you roll from phone to phone to phone, they drop phones and go to other phones, and then we have to go update the, the paperwork and get the state attorney's uh, uh, approval, and then the ultimately the judge that's overseeing the case is approval before we can intercept the communications but there was 11 different telephones in, in this operation how critical were these wiretaps to getting these criminals off the street the the law clearly says that if there's a any other method to successfully dismantle the organization you can't use communications interceptions or a wiretap 
So you have to exhaust other investigative methods before you go to a wiretap. So this organization could not have been dismantled absent this operation with this wiretap. And keep in mind, this investigation is still ongoing. You know, people watching this, you know, and I hope you're tuned in on your favorite social media. We're after you too. Don't sleep well tonight. Don't think you're going to just drink good wine and snort Coke, you know. We're after you. Sheriff, have you been in touch with California law enforcement and what's been their response to this? Oh, sure. Fre well, Fresno, we, we worked hand in glove and we worked with our federal partners, but our California law enforcement partners are game on to help. They, they, they work very, very hard. It's just it's difficult in a, in a state like California where they make misdemeanors out of possession of heroin and methamphetamine and cocaine. I'm trying to encourage everybody who wants to deal with or use drugs, all move to California. You know, if you just, if you just go out there, you know, we wouldn't put you in state prison anymore here until you start sending your drugs back here. Because California still hadn't got the message, but slowly but surely they are as their crime rate goes up, their homelessness, homelessness is, is out of control, the tax pace is crazy, the good people are losing their mind in California. There's just not enough good people out there to lose their mind to make a difference. So at the end of the day, uh, if you want to use drugs, go to California and stay there. Use it out there. It's a misdemeanor and we won't bother you here in Florida, but we want to lock your butt up here. Anything else? Thank you very much. Y'all have a great weekend. See you the next time we bust up a bunch of criminals. Oh, and we're working on some of them right now. They don't need to sleep well tonight either. You just don't know which ones we're after, but you will know when we put handcuffs on you. Thank you.